One of the most unsettling statistics is how here in the United States, we spend more taxpayer money per capita on providing publicly funded health care than countries who have universal health care. So that means that despite having a private system, which we pay for individually and through our work, we spend more money as taxpayers on government funded health care programs. It's one of those things where somehow we're putting in more effort on both the private and the public front, yet healthcare is still less available in a general sense. Now, I don't want to get into discussions about healthcare systems and funding. The topic of this video is about the body on a very personal level. But I think that that statistic represents a broader issue we have. You could say Western cultures, which is that this internal external divide, this sort of isolated individual in a hostile world that we have. You know, we always feel as though we need to overcome and dominate all the problems. We need to become someone who's strong and takes action and forces the world to be the way it should be, forces your body, breaks down your body so that you can build it back up, disciplines yourself in terms of your diet. And some of this is productive, but we, we should ask ourselves why we have this multi-billion dollar health and wellness industry, fitness industry, yet continue to have some of the most significant health issues, particularly related with health problems that stem from voluntary action, such as poor diet and poor lifestyle, just sort of regular human activities that we, on the whole, really struggle to do. Myself very much included in that. But I think briefly, it's important to note that a lot of this disregard for the body and passions and desires and this holistic relationship with the world comes from the philosophical roots of our Western tradition in Plato and, and others of the time who sought to emphasize the primacy of rational thinking and the mind over the world. Now, they would have still had a more holistic idea concerning at least the mind's relationship with the world. But later on, through further developments, we could say Descartes and the Enlightenment and Hobbes and Hume and just all these various figures who, who kind of coalesces to give us this idea of the strong individual pursuing their sort of happiness, a kind of hedonistic idea of, well, the best life is the life where you can attain the most pleasures, you can attain the most satisfaction, you can pursue happiness. Now, the problem then becomes, how much effort is really required to attain this happiness? How much effort, how much stuff do you really need? How much money do you need? How much accomplishment do you need? And say that we've developed a certain idea where this incessant pursuit of happiness is the best life. And it's very individualistic. It's very much about acquiring possessions, about taking control of the world, taking control of your life asserting yourself on an external world, on other people and an environment which are different than you. Entirely, we see our relationship with it as, as that internal external divide. That divide was really a creation. And so this is where we get into that stark division between East and West. As we heard in the Alan Watts quote, the average Eastern child might ask when they grew from the earth and not when they were sort of inserted into it, embodied. One of the more popular Taoist concepts would be Wu Wei. Action through inaction or non-action or it's put in a few different ways. I'll briefly summarize that. It's good, but I kind of want to get really specific about how Taoism talks about the body and tie that back to body dysmorphia, which is something that I do think is tied to a lot of our Western beliefs. If we think before about this massive effort we put in, we want to be disciplined. We want to have routine. We want to make sure we're pushing ourselves. And this very, you know, strict, powerful mindset. Taoism would urge that there's really not that much to be done. And it's funny when you think about it. The people who live the longest, who seem to be the healthiest, are always the most balanced people. There's always the story about the queen would have one cocktail before bed. You always hear about people like this. They go for walks. You know, they have... A couple drinks, they never go too far. They eat foods they like, but they don't stuff themselves day in and day out. It's always this balance. And here, and I'll admit here, I do this too, where I will eat a lot and then work out a lot. I'll stuff myself, overdo things, and then I overcompensate in the gym 
and it's this sort of seesaw back and forth. I'm putting in this monumental effort, but never really physically changing that much. So the body there can be a kind of metaphor for, I mean, anything really, accomplishments in life, maintaining a relationship. It's not that you do nothing. When they say action through inaction, what they mean is not taking action when it isn't necessary, not acting on something which through your acting on them will bring about that result. Easy examples here, overbearing parents, overbearing partners. One quote from the Da Te Ching here, which is primary early Taoist text. Those who act on things will be defeated by them. Those who take things in their hands will lose them. And so it's this idea that if certain things have their natural course, interfering with them in order to make sure they end up where you want them to be can often cause them to not go to the place that they just naturally would have gone anyway. So when we think of action through inaction, we think of Wu Wei, we shouldn't think of really just sitting back all the time, but just not interfering when it isn't necessary, not always thinking we need to have complete control, not always thinking it's about discipline and overcoming and strength. Sometimes your goals can be accomplished through very, very little effort, but placed in the right location. So it's more about knowing when to act and being in control of yourself such that you're not always acting on things. Just as an example of how serious Taoism takes the body, I'm going to read chapter 13 from the Tao Te Ching, discussing the body and our care for the world. Thus, if you esteem taking care of your body more than you do taking care of the world, then you can be entrusted with the world. If you love your body as if it were the world, then the world can be handed over to you. And so this is interesting, right? It kind of inverts our normal way of thinking. If we want to change the world, if we care about moral problems, we need to be so hyper fixated on them. It's vain to take care of yourself. It's vain to think about what's good for you when there's all these terrible things going on out in the world. But Taoism, and it's funny, you know, we find find similar things like this in contemporary people like Michel Foucault. Taoism would say the body is a model for the cosmos. So we could think of it like this. Let's invert the normal way we would think about like science or understanding the world and ourselves where contemporary neuroscience, we might say, well, what is our brain such that the world appears to us this way? You know, what is this organ such that this is how we experience things. Whereas something like Taoism would say, well, what is the world such that I have this brain, that I have this body? What is the world such that I have these emotions? How did everything about the human condition and the human body emerge necessarily from the world as such? And I know that's kind of a deeper question, but I think if you just replay that a few times and think about it, it can really shift this relationship you have with life in the world, this connectivity that you have with it, not just in a hacky kind of mental hack way, but in a serious way. Going back to the quote from the Tao Te Ching, Taoism thinks that this sort of internal care, this care for the self, is not only a way to just be happy yourself and not worry about other things. When you approach problems in your life, whether it's at work or in relationships or with moral issues with other people, political stuff, whatever, your diet, right? Your body, you have a relationship with the world such that you don't feel like you need to dominate it. Like you always need to be in control of it because then it'll slip away. Let's connect all this back to something like body dysmorphia. Body dysmorphia is so difficult because it's hard to believe people when they say that you look good. It's almost impossible speak from from some experience as well here too but i know a lot of people have it worse than me where i've never really been able to roll that into my conception of myself even if i am self-deprecating and i say like you know i feel bad about this or that and someone says what are you talking about that's not true it's always well they're just being nice right even if i look in the mirror and it looks good i think well it just i can't sink it in and that's body dysmorphia it's this distrust of yourself, this distrust of the world, this lack of a connection such that your body feels like this thing that you're stuck in. 
It feels like this thing that doesn't represent your mind, this thing that you can't control and you just can't get a handle on, even though you're trying so hard. Maybe you're in the gym, maybe you're thinking about your diet, but you're so obsessed that then you fall off of that detrimental ways and get back on. And it's just this never ending, tenuous struggle. But Taoism would say, why are you trying? Stop relating to your body that way in that aggressive, controlling way and see your body as your access to the world. Your body as the world in you, the world come to life. To really drive this home, I want to look at this image. This was an image drawn by a Taoist monk who was asked to draw a model of the human body. Now, I want you to think about this in stark contrast to the sort of rigorous, accurate, anatomical models we would talk about in the West. Taoism, you could zoom out here. Yeah, we can study just the brain and what it does and when. But if we zoom out, it's a node in a system. Every single thing that the brain does is in an interaction with a real part of the world. Everything from light to sound to vibrations. You are something that all of the real parts of the world has coalesced. You've brought all of the natural real elements of the world into a body that can oscillate with it. You're, you are all of those things that are hitting you. You're made of the same stuff and you're in it. There's not a separation. We have this perception of a separation because we have memory and we can reflect and we can remember and see ourselves as this consistent stream of thought, but we're just as much it as it is us. A lot of this represents how our most base desires, our most base and separate instincts, everything from lust to hunger to craving knowledge, anything, these start in the bottom here, right? They start down in the water, the sort of the earth. And they move up, they kind of coalesce. You see uh, the earth being sort of harvested and plowed. And then as we get more towards the middle, we get things more being cultivated and brought together. And as we get to the top, it's this body cultivation, as it would be called. You cultivate all of your sort of disparate and difficult to pin down emotions and desires and thoughts and knowledge. You cultivate them, you bring them together, you sort of unify them. And we get up into the idea of the mountains and this sort of stretching into the heavens where we can see that all of these seemingly separate things about the world, all these various, I mean, everything from material forms to different people to different ideas stem from the same source, are moved by the same force. They generate and fall away and regenerate and fall away. And so the particular things, we shouldn't get so hung up. And I know that it seems like we're really out here. We're talking deep philosophy stuff, but I mean, everything from a small waist to big arms. If we have this fixation on exactly what we want to look like, on exactly what our life should be, on exactly how much money we should make, we lose our identity because our identity is not each particular little thing. As humans, we can always get back in touch with that source. The sort of the Tao is always generating. It's always generative. And so one last metaphor to talk about is sort of the 10,000 things, which Taoism will often bring up, which both refers to the kind of multiplicity, how there's just so many different identities, so many different people, so many different things, and how all of them are really just one thing. And how if you live your life on based on one or two or three of the quote, 10,000 things, you're missing the rest. Letting go of obsessions over small bits of reality allows us to then pick up new stuff and to get in touch with what we are, which is, which is all of it. It's this connection with the cosmos. This isn't entirely incompatible with really modern thinking here. I remember in the show Cosmos, uh, the new one with Neil deGrasse Tyson, the first season, we talk about things like the universe coming alive and thinking about itself. It really is this coalescing of the entire functionality of the cosmos into a body. And that body has access to all of that. It can't possess all of it. You're one thing. And so seeking to possess and dominate the world will just always defeat you. When it comes to the body, when it comes to taking care of yourself, when it comes to how you look, how you feel, how you live, taking care of your body 
is a representation of taking care of the world. And if you take care of yourself, it will follow. If you just learn to let your body speak to you and not try to dominate it and take control of it, and that your looks, these particular aspects of your physique or whatever, it's fickle. It'll change. Everybody's body standards change. People have no idea how to generate these things. They just come and go. And so what do you want with your body? How do you want to feel? If there's anything we can take away from Taoism here, I think it's this interest in this more holistic approach and this more, you're the world too. These degrees of separation that we've created are just that. They're just creations. I know that this video wasn't some grand satisfactory account of how to cure body dysmorphia or something, because I think that's really hard. It's something I still deal with as well. But it's a start. And I think it also speaks to how the way we think and the way we relate to the world, there's a lot more going on sort of under the surface than we think in our minds, in our psyche, right? We hold a lot of commitments about the world that we just don't really call to mind. And if we can get more upstream like that, if you can go deeper into your mind and kind of work on these little beliefs and these little commitments that you didn't even know you had, it can fix so many things further downstream. And so stop fighting and wrestling with everything on the surface level. Stop treating the symptom. Stop treating the symptom of body dysmorphia and get to the root cause. I think that is the biggest takeaway we can have from this. Thanks for listening. It's kind of a more rambling video because Taoism is vague, but that's the beauty of it. Please very much, you know, share in the comments. Let me know what you guys think and let me know maybe what you think Taoism could be used for or something else you think maybe could be better. I mean, really anything. But I think incorporating these other ways of thinking into ours can really help some of the problems that it just seems like we just cannot solve in our own culture. <laughs>